Welcome to Advanced Exercise Physiology. This is Chapter 20, Laboratory Assessment of Human Performance. The objectives of this chapter are to 1. Discuss the factors that determine the effectiveness of a physiological test of athletic performance. 2. To define specificity of VO2 max. 3. To explain the difference between VO2 max and VO2 peak. 4. To discuss the physiological rationale for the assessment of the lactate threshold in endurance athletes. 5. To describe methods for the assessment of anaerobic power. 6. To discuss the techniques used to evaluate muscular strength. For those of you taking notes, here is an outline that will help you follow the lecture. Now looking at physiological testing, the theory and the ethics. Physical performance is determined by the capacity for maximal energy output both aerobic and anaerobic. It also looks at muscular strength, coordination and economy of movement, and psychological factors such as motivation and tactics. Laboratory testing should stress the same physiological systems required by the sport or the event, and athletes should volunteer for the testing. In the diagram below, we see the factors that contribute to physical performance. We see that coordination and economy, environment, psychological factors, and energy output, both aerobic and anaerobic, as well as strength, contribute to performance. Now, if we look at what the athlete gains from physiological testing, we see that they get information regarding their strengths and weaknesses, and this can serve as a baseline data to plan training programs. There's also feedback regarding the effectiveness of the training program and education about the physiology of exercise. Now, what physiological tests will and will not do include a difficult ability to simulate the sports in the laboratory, both physiological and psychological demands. It's also difficult to predict performance from a single battery of tests, where performance in the field is the ultimate test of athletic success. What are some of the components of effective physiological testing? Well, the physiological variables tested should be relevant to the sport, the test should be valid and reliable. The test should be sport specific. They should be repeated at regular intervals. The testing procedure should be carefully controlled. And the test results should be interpreted by the coach and the athlete. Now, when looking at the reliability of physiological performance tests, we see that in order for a test to be useful, the results must be reliable. Reliability is higher when experienced athletes are tested that are highly motivated and better able to pace themselves. The equipment as well must be calibrated and power output must be reproducible. Finally, athletes should be tested in ways that mimic the events, i.e. cyclists tested on a cycle ergometer as opposed to a treadmill. In summary, Designing laboratory tests to assess physical performance requires an understanding of those factors that contribute to success in a particular sport. Physical performance is determined by the interaction of the following factors, which are maximal energy output, muscular strength, coordination and economy of movement, and psychological factors such as motivation and tactics. In order to be effective, physiological tests should be 1. relevant to the sport, 2. valid and reliable, three sports specific, four repeated at regular intervals, five standardized, and six interpreted to the coach and the athlete. Now looking at direct testing of the maximal aerobic power, we see that VO2 max is considered the best test for predicting success in endurance events. However, other factors are also important, but we do see that this is a better predictor in heterogeneous groups. We also see that this is the most accurate means of measurement in the direct testing in a laboratory which would be called open circuit spirometry. With regards to the specificity of the testing, the test should be specific to the athlete's sport. For example, runners tested on a treadmill. The exercise test protocol is the following. It should use large muscle groups. Optimal test length is 10 to 12 minutes. You would start with a three to five minute warm up and then increase work rate to near maximal load. The increased load stepwise should happen every one to four minutes until the subject cannot maintain the desired work rate. Looking at the criteria for VO2 max, you would see a plateau in the volume of oxygen with an increasing work rate. This is rarely observed in incremental tests. However, the blood lactate concentration, 
should reach approximately greater than 80 millimoles per liter, and the respiratory exchange ratio should be greater than 1.15. Finally, the heart rate in the last stage should be plus or minus 10 beats within the heart rate max. Here is a chart looking at how to determine the VO2 max in an exercise test. What you can see, the arrow is pointing to the plateau and the oxygen uptake like previously described. Now looking at the determination of a peak VO2 in a paraplegic athlete, we see that the paraplegic athlete can be tested using an arm exercise, for example, an arg ergometer or a wheelchair ergometer. The highest VO2 measured during arm exercise is not considered the VO2 max, hence we call it the peak VO2. Higher peak VO2 is, is found using an accelerated protocol. The test starts at 50 to 60 percent of the peak VO2. This limits muscular fatigue early in the test. In summary, the measurement of VO2 max requires the use of large muscle groups and should be specific to the movement required by the athlete in his or her event or sport. A VO2 max test can be judged to be valid if the two of the following criteria are met. One, the respiratory exchange ratio is greater than 1.15. Two, the heart rate during the last stage of the test is plus or minus 10 beats per minute within the predicted heart rate max and or the plateau of the VO2 within the increased work rate. Also, arm crank ergometry and wheelchair ergometry have been used to determine the peak VO2 in paraplegic athletes. Now looking at laboratory tests to predict endurance performance, we see peak running velocity, which is the highest speed that can be maintained for approximately greater than 5 seconds. We also look at lactate threshold, where exercise intensity at which the blood lactate acid begins to systematically increase. This is a direct measurement and an estimation of Vantilori threshold. There's also critical power, which is the speed at which running speed over time curve reaches a plateau. Now the measurement of peak running velocity to predict performance. We see the peak running velocity is tested on a treadmill or a track with progressively increasing the speed on a treadmill. Again, it's the highest speed that can be maintained for greater than 5 seconds. It is an excellent predictor of the 5 kilometer run performance with a strong correlation of negative 0.97. There's also a good predictor of the 10 to 90 kilometer race performance as well. Here you see the relationship between peak running velocity and the 5 kilometer race performance. Now when we look at the use of the lactate threshold to evaluate performance, we see that lactate threshold estimates maximal steady state running speed, which is a predictor of success in distance running events. The direct determination of lactate threshold can happen with a 2-5 to five minute warm-up and a stepwise increase in work rate every 1-3 to three minutes. Then you would measure blood lactate at each work rate. The lactate threshold is the break point in the lactate VO2 graph. Now looking at the prediction of lactate threshold by ventilary alterations, we see that the ventilary threshold, it is the point at which there is a sudden increase in ventilation. And this is used to estimate the lactate threshold. Here is a graph displaying how lactate threshold is measured in relation to oxygen uptake. And now as well, we see the ventilary threshold as a predictor of the lactate threshold. Now looking at the measurement of critical power, we see that critical power is the running speed at which running speed over time curve reaches a plateau. The power output that can be maintained indefinitely. However, most athletes fatigue in 30 to 60 minutes when exercising at critical power. Looking at the measurement of critical power, the subject performs a series of times exercise trials to exhaustion. The prediction of performance in events lasting 3 to 100 minutes is highly correlated with a high VO2 max and lactate threshold. Here is the concept of critical power where we see the plateau. In summary, common laboratory tests to predict endurance performance include measurement of lactate threshold, 
critical power, and peak running velocity. All these measurements have been proven useful in predicting performance and endurance events. The lactate threshold can be determined using an incremental exercise test using any one of several exercise modalities like the treadmill, cycle ergometer, etc. The lactate threshold represents an exercise intensity at which the blood lactate acid levels begin to systematically increase. Also, critical power is defined as the running speed, i.e. power output at which running speed over time curve reaches a plateau. In addition, the peak running velocity, meters per second, can be determined on a treadmill or track and is defined as the highest speed that can be maintained for more than 5 seconds. Now if we look at tests to determine exercise economy, we see that higher economy means that less energy is expended to maintain a given speed. So a runner with a high running economy should defeat a less economical runner in a race. Looking at the measurement of the oxygen cost of running at various speeds, we plot the oxygen requirement as a function of the running speed. Greater running economy is reflected at a lower oxygen cost. Here is an example of the oxygen cost of running curve for two subjects. We see that runner B has a lower oxygen cost. Now when we are estimating distance running success using the lactate threshold and running economy, we see a close relationship between the lactate threshold and maximum pace in a 10 kilometer race, where the run pace at 5 meters per minute above lactate threshold. So if we are predicting performance in a 10 kilometer race, we would measure VO2 max and plot the VO versus the running speed. We would determine the lactate threshold and plot the blood lactate versus the VO2. And then the VO2 at the lactate threshold is equal to approximately 40 milliliters per kilogram minute, where a VO2 of 40 milliliters per kilogram minute is equal to the running speed of 200 meters per minute. This is the estimated 10K running time. Now the two graphs below reflect the running economy and the lactate results from the incremental exercise test that we just described. In summary, success in an endurance event can be predicted by a laboratory assessment of the athlete's movement economy, the VO2 max, and the lactate threshold. These parameters can be used to determine the maximal race pace an athlete can maintain for a given racing distance. Now asking the question, can laboratory testing of young athletes predict future champions? The greatest interest in using laboratory testing is to predict future success, such as myel biopsy for fiber type determination. However, no laboratory tests that they accurately predict the ultimate ability of an athlete. Other factors that cannot be measured are extremely important, most importantly potentially being psychological factors. Now if we look at the determination of maximal anaerobic power, we see that testing should involve energy pathways used in the event. For example, ultra short term tests involve the ATP creatine phosphate system, where short term tests involve anaerobic glycolysis. Below is a chart or a graph of the energy system contribution during maximal exercises. We see that both the ATP creatine phosphate system glycolysis and aerobic metabolism change over time. So tests of ultra short term anaerobic power events test the ATP creatine phosphate system. Power tests involve jumping power test, running power test, which would be used in American football like a series of 40 yard dashes with brief recovery period or in soccer an intermittent shuttle test. There's also cycling power test which is the Quebec 10 second test. Here is a chart of a series of 40-yard dashes to test aerobic power for athlete A and B. In addition, Table 20.1 lists the classification of football players based on a 40-yard dash time. Moving on to test of short-term anaerobic power, we see that we want to test anaerobic glycolysis. Cycling tests would involve the Wingate test, where subject pedals as rapidly as possible for 30 seconds against a predetermined load based on body weight. The peak power indicated 
is the ATP creatine phosphate system. And the percentage of peak power decline is an index of the ATP creatine phosphate system and glycolysis. We also see running tests where we're doing maximal runs of 200 to 800 meters or sport specific tests. Table 20.2 lists the resistance settings for the Wingate test based on the subject's body weight. In summary, anaerobic power tests are classified as ultra short term tests to determine the maximal capacity of the ATP creatine phosphate system and short term tests to evaluate the maximal capacity of the anaerobic glycolysis. Ultra short term and short term power tests should be sport specific in an effort to provide the athlete and the coach with feedback about the athlete's current fitness level. Now looking at muscular strength, we will define it as the maximal force that can be generated by a muscle or muscle group. It is assessed by an isometric, isometric measurement, which is the static force of a muscle using a tensile meter. We can use free weight testing, where we use a weight in the dumbbell or barbell, barbell that remains constant, and we look at a one rep max lift or a hand grip dynometer. There's also isokinetic measurements, where variable resistance at a constant speed and variable resistance devices where there's variable resistance over a range of motion. Here's a diagram looking at the measurement of maximal isometric force during knee extension. Next we see a hand grip danometer to assess grip strength. And now we see an isokinetic assessment of the knee extension. Now here is the printout from an isokinetic dynamometer during a knee extension. In summary, muscular strength is defined as the maximum force that can be generated by a muscle or muscle group. Evaluation of muscular strength is useful in assessing training programs for athletes involved in power sports or events. Muscular strength can be evaluated using any one of these following techniques. 1. Isometric. 2. Free weight testing. 3. Isokinetic, and 4. Variable Resistance Devices. This concludes the content for Chapter 20. Next are a series of study questions that will help you test your knowledge of the top chapter. 1. Discuss the rationale behind laboratory testing designed to assess physical performance in athletes. How do these tests differ from general physical fitness tests? 2. Define maximal oxygen uptake. Why might relative VO2 max be the single most important factor and predicting distance running success in a heterogeneous group of runners. 3. Discuss the concept of specificity of testing for the determination of VO2 max. Give a brief overview of the design of an incremental test to determine the VO2 max. What criteria can be used to determine the validity of a VO2 max test? 4. Briefly explain the technique employed to determine the lactate threshold and the ventilatory threshold. 5. Describe how the economy of running might be evaluated in a laboratory. Six, discuss the theory and procedures involved in predicting success in distance running. Seven, explain how short-term maximal anaerobic power can be evaluated by field test. Eight, describe how the Wingate test is used to assess medium-term anaerobic power. Nine, provide an overview of the one rep max technique to evaluate muscular strength. Why might a computer-assisted danometer be superior to the one rep max technique in assessing strength changes? 10. Discuss the advantages and disadvantages of each of the following types of strength measurements. Isometric, free weights, isokinetic, and variable resistance. This concludes Chapter 20, The Laboratory Assessment of Human Performances. Please reference this lecture as well as your text for any questions and for further studies. In addition, feel free to email me at any point. Thanks.